Drew's gonna talk a little bit about how to make better content. I'm gonna talk about what you can do if you already have some video lying around. Um, it may have been shot with a iPhone, with a prosumer camera. I think a lot of people still have some video lying around they just don't quite know what to do with. Um, and the first thing most people think about is technical touches. There's a lot you can do in post-production to improve the watchability of your video. Um, some of the things we'll talk about might be a little bit out of your grasp if you're not a professional editor like Drew here. Um, but with a little bit of effort, a little bit of Googling, you can figure some of this out. The first most important thing that John and I have been discussing at length is sound. Um, studies have shown that viewers will, they'll tolerate bad video, but they will not tolerate bad sound if it's distracting, um, if there's a lot of background noise, if it's muffled. So there are some things you can do with sound. Um, there's noise reduction tools, filters, things like that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up actually to preface that is drop-off rates. I've read that uh, you have about 10 seconds to get a viewer's attention and if you don't have their attention or you don't grab their interest, they're going to click away from your video. So sound is really important and, you can, and there are things you can do after the fact. There's also color correction. Bob back there is one of our fabulous editors, has done a lot with color correction tools, um, filters like that. He's laughing, he's helped me several times. There's also my favorite tool where Bob has saved me in the past is image sharpening. If something is a little bit out of focus, there are things you can do to sharpen up the images and just make it look a little bit better. So I wanted to use an example, we're calling it a case study. Uh, one of my clients here, The Whole You, you've probably heard they've launched recently. We've done a lot of videos for them, but there was a really, really quick turnaround video they wanted to do. They had to shoot it themselves just to get it ready to go, but they turned it over to us to add some professional touches to really make it sing. So I'm going to show you some of the raw footage. Four, three, two, one. Hi, I'm Margaret from The Whole You, and we challenge you to a scavenger hunt on Friday, April 11th, or Saturday, April 12th. We're going to show you how fun and easy it is to play. Five, four, three, two, one. That's it! It was fun, easy, and as an added bonus, we got 5,273 steps in. Woo! Register now, and on April 10th, we'll send you the Scavenger Hunt website. See, See you there! there. Nice. Yeah, that's good. So this is oh, just a really fun client. I really, really like working with them. And they, they have fun with all the projects they do. But you know, this was shot with the same camera that the main client shot, you know, her her son's first steps with. It's it's an HD camera, but it's a consumer grade HD camera. And they really just needed to hand it over to us to make it sing. So I'll show you what we ended up doing with that. Which is coming up. from the whole you and we challenge you to a scavenger hunt on Friday April 11th or Saturday April 12th we're gonna show you how fun and easy it is to play you can do it on your own with your co-workers or bring your friends and family to show off our beautiful campus you can start from anywhere on campus we decided to start at the quad let's go Woo! Hunt website. 
So you, you could still tell it, it wasn't a completely professional production, but it's really fun and it tells a good story. And we took some existing content and really kind of made it sing. The funny thing is I was talking to them yesterday and they, they wanted this video to get out really quickly um, and be really fun and high energy to up the number of people who are doing the scavenger hunt actually today and tomorrow. And they said when, we, when they came to me, they had about 250 people registered and now they have almost 700 people registered. And that was right after the video came out and they sent it out to the campus community. So it's a good example of how, you know, using video can help tell your story and get people engaged. It's also a good segue into the, the next topic. Um, this is one thing I've really observed myself, is using video as an ingredient of your story, not the main dish. The video doesn't have, it doesn't have to be literal. It's something John and I were talking about. People tend to think of video being very literal, like I want to talk about a program that does this, so I have to show this actually happening. Um, there's so many other facets that you can do, and I'm just going to go right into this UW Bothell in 60 seconds. UW Bothell has video they've shot all year long. Some of it's time lapse of some buildings being built, some of it's lecture capture, um, some of it's just B roll from campus. And they came to us, they wanted a year end video that really told a story about how exciting it is that UW Bothell is growing. So here is again some existing video and what we did to make it sing. So there you can see, you know, the video may not have been a literal translation to the points that we were talking about. The graphics are almost as important and the music is almost important as the video in that case. We've changed the color, some of it's black and white, some of it's got a purple hue. It's really playing around and not being so literal with using your existing video to tell your story. Um, and the last thing that I beg of you uh, is don't be afraid to cut. I, I think that what, what, the statistic I wanted to bring up, um, you'll lose about a third of your viewers in 30 seconds with online video, 45% of them drop off after a minute, and then almost 60% of them drop off in two minutes. So you really need to get to the point really quickly. You may have a really interesting lecture uh, that has a bunch of interesting facts in it, but if you want to just tell people about this one fact that this lecturer said, just use that. Just use that 30 second clip or that one minute clip of the really interesting meat of your story. Um, even if the, the video and the audio isn't great, just that one clip, somebody will hang on to that and they'll share it with their friends. And but that, I think that's my biggest piece of advice is don't be afraid to cut. I know everything seems really valuable to you, but just cut, cut, cut. Just you only use things that advance the story. Yeah. Would you then maybe in the description have a link to the full lecture? Exactly. That's so something we... tiny percentage of people who would like to do this. Yeah, that's something we've exper experimented with here um, is we, we know that viewers get intimidated by seeing a 20 minute video. I get intimidated by seeing a five minute video. Um, so we'll have maybe a two or three minute excerpt and then, yeah, if you want to watch the full thing, click here. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great, great tactic. So that's me. Cool. There you are. Well, Drew gets ready, um, just want to throw out a scenario that may sound familiar to some of you. So somebody comes to you and asks you to conduct an interview with a new faculty member, a new staff member, get it on the website. Does that sound like something that's pretty realistic around here? Um, Drew has some great tips for us. 
uh, some simple yet effective techniques for improving the quality of the video that you have to produce on the fly with, with um, ambient surroundings and no tools, um, just get it done. And so this is, uh, this is Gorilla Video 101, <laughs> Drew Keller, and uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this. Me too. Is it up there or is it just there? Oh, see, okay, there we go. My confusion, I'm sitting there looking at the screen. So we're going to try to go through and give you just some nuts and bolts, some really practical things that you can hopefully facilitate. As audio is key, but there are a whole slew of things that you might want to consider. When you're creating content, even if it's just somebody who's an expert in a subject matter and they're just going to be talking on camera, you need to begin to think about how you can augment the idea visually. Uh, it, most people get lost in the words. They're concentrating on the script. That's what they think of. Video is not radio. You really need to be thinking about how you're going to engage someone. The reason why is we get a tremendous amount of the information that we get every day visually. We get 90% of the information, the things that we learn, the things that we know through visual stimulus. And when we do eye tracking studies, when we look at things in terms of how people engage, particularly in a web environment, they spend a very small percentage, often less than 15% of the time, looking at the person. Because if it's just a talking head, they get bored, they start looking at controls, they start looking at the banner ads, all the text, everything else. You need to be providing stimulus that is more than just the words. Now, certainly, when we're storytelling, what we're trying to do is make certain that you're delivering a coherent story. We have all of these different ways that we tell stories, different voices, and the script is certainly part of it. It's often your foundation. It's something that gives you structure. But we have another narrative voice that we use, and that's our images. You need to think about how your image may augment the story, how it may complement it. Sometimes you're telling a narrative visually that doesn't go in lockstep with the script, but gives richer, deeper examination of it. The other voice you have is sound. You need to think very carefully about all the natural sound that's in an environment. It's a great way to tell a story. Think about the number of times you've maybe seen something on television or, or in a movie where you hear the sound of the ambulance before you actually see it. It foreshadows that something is going to happen. So the sound of the environment is a really rich part of that narrative. And then the last part is often music, as we saw in the last as we saw in the last piece, that story was really driven by the tempo and the cadence of the music and all of the visual images were using that as the scaffolding to tell that story. So your job as a storyteller is to try to manage these four different voices that you have. And at times they coincide and at times they don't. And that's the fun part of storytelling. It's much more than just thinking of a script. But let's start with the idea of visual storytelling and how you might tell it. One of the things that almost everyone forgets is that the environment is a character in your story. Where you choose to do your interview, where you choose to shoot, is critical to the engagement. Um, putting somebody against a wall is not necessarily a good choice. It's going to frame where someone is, who they are, it gives them credibility, it gives additional information um, to your viewer. For example, any guesses where this guy is? He's a salesman, what's, what's he talking about? Anybody have any guesses? Ah, uh, it's a good guess. It's definitely athletics. He's talking about action cameras. And I'm at a conference. You know, cameras you mount on helmets or handlebars like GoPros and, and, and those sorts of things. Now, I could have done this interview. We're at a trade show. I certainly could have done this interview against one of the white walls in the background. I mean, a lot of people are like, well, let's go someplace that's, that's, that's neutral. The advantage of shooting it in this environment is it gives him credibility. Oh, look at all the stuff that's in the background. Oh, he must be an expert. Oh, we know who he is. Oh, we see the context. Also, if you're in an environment like this, a conference, a, a trade show, something like that, they tend to be very high noise environments, which makes it sometimes 
difficult to hear them as clearly as you would like and you in essence are motivating why that noise is there. People tend to cut you a little bit more slack if they understand why all that noise is there. But most importantly we look at the background, we look at the environment, we go, oh he must know what he's talking about based upon what's going on. You can also augment what's going on with abstract backgrounds. Uh, any guesses what these guys are talking about? Genetics. Exactly. They're talking about genetic <laughs> medicine. And the idea is you can take something that's abstract, the work that they're doing, and this is actually what's sometimes referred to as a practical. It's not green screen. It is a laptop with the slide projected on the wall behind them out of focus. Now it's been treated, uh, it's been color corrected, and there's vignetting. But the idea was rather than doing it as a green screen, let's shoot with a white wall and light it. Difficult setup, but again, we're trying to give context to their research and what's going on with an abstract background rather than just a plain background. You need to be careful though that you don't give an impression that you don't intend. So if you look at this, if you see this as a shot, what do you think of the quality of this presentation? It's empty. Yeah, it's pretty dreadful. And, and, and if you went there, if, if, if you went to go videotape your peer presenting at a conference and this is the establishing shot, people are going to go, no one cares about the research. Um, you may go in there and go, wow, this is terrific. Look how big this room is. This is really important. This is really cool. I want to get a sense of the scale of this room. That's your emotion at the time and I understand that, but unfortunately the message you send is no one cared. And so perhaps just moving the camera behind some heads in the foreground, having them in the background, would have given a sense of people there without all of the empty chairs. So you need to be careful of how you manage it. And don't the, be afraid to group everybody. Exactly, Get right. Get group together. The other thing we use when we shoot a lot is something called the rule of thirds. And the rule of thirds, actually, scientifically, we don't start looking in the middle of a frame. We tend to look at one of these corners. And so if you leverage verticals or horizontal lines, to give, to leverage rules of thirds, it can help immensely. It can give your images more interest, something that's more compelling. We tend to shoot by just kind of dropping things in the middle of the frame. Really boring, it's not how we look at it. So if we take this shot and we just move it over and tilt up a little bit, leveraging the rule of thirds, we end up with an image that's far more interesting to look at. And the vertical mast of the ship and the horizontal line of the water helps us to create an image that is more compelling. And when we look at it, we actually move clockwise around the image. We tend to start at the bright part where the ship is and move up clockwise to the mountains and then down around. It's just naturally how someone will look at an image. It gives more information, basically of information that is revealed, that is unfolding out of that image. So we tend to like to leverage the rule of thirds in a lot of the ways we shoot. And it's really not all that difficult to do. All you have to think about is A, pick a subject, and B, where am I going to put it? That's not always as easy as it sounds. There have been times when I'm shooting at an environment like Las Vegas. All of these signs in front of you, you've got all this chaos of stuff in front of you. The audience also finds that environment really chaotic. So your goal is to pick something that the audience clearly knows you're going to identify leverage the rule of thirds from there, and then work out so they can move out within the image from there. The rule of thirds isn't a hard and fast rule. I, I actually sometimes call it the starting point of thirds. You're there, you look at it and go, wow, this is boring, what can I do? You tend and you start moving something around in the frame and the rule of thirds, you go, that's okay, but you know, I think I'm gonna tilt up a little bit more or move over a little bit more. What often happens is the part you're trying to emphasize is in the two-thirds, and the part you're not emphasizing as much is in the one-third. For example, think of the hideous vacation photos you've had to look at from friends, and it's a sunset of the water. And the water is in a horizontal line, and the clouds are great, and the water's just kind of dull. Well, if you tilt up and use the water line as the bottom third in those clouds, you're emphasizing the clouds. You may look up and go, that's interesting, but you know, I think I want it to be the rule of four-fifths. It's really a starting point for you to begin to create images that are more compelling and more interesting for how you drive through it. So you also need to think about stabilizing your camera. 
you really, really, really need a tripod, particularly if you're going to zoom the, zoom the image. I always have a tripod with me in some form, shape, or fashion. Even a small pocket tripod can save you tremendous grief. Your audience gets fatigued trying to track something, particularly in a web environment, trying to track something within there. If the camera is moving, give it a reason to move. You're walking with them, you're in a car. But if someone's sitting behind a desk and the camera's moving, the audience is going to bail. They're not going to watch. They're not going to engage. They want a stable image to work from. There are all kinds of tripods out there. Really cost-effective ones you could buy at a um, variety store, you know, Fred Meyer or something like that, up to, I have tripods that are tens of thousands of dollars. and. They're kind of like a, your favorite pan or knife in the kitchen or your baseball mitt. You need to find something you're going to use. You need to go to the store, pick them up. We measure them based upon the number of segments to a leg. Most consumer tripods have three sections you can release out. Um, professional tripods usually only have one or two sections. Uh, camping, you know, tripods you may take for hiking may have four sections. The more sections, the wobblier it is, but that's okay. Because I'll take a four section wobbly tripod that nobody's touching over no tripod at all. It's better to have something that you're going to use. A tripod in your closet really is of no use at all. A lot of the cameras that we use have image stabilization. They, they have this little gyroscope in there. They're designed to hold a shot briefly for about 10 seconds or so. You literally are going to start seeing someone breathing if they're, doing, if, 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 if they're trying to use image stabilization. It doesn't work for things like interviews or those sorts of things. So go to the store, pick them out, take a look at them. This is a really big professional tripod that I use. And the, the reason why we use big heavy tripods is mass equals stability. The heavier, bigger it is, the lower the center of gravity, the less it's going to move. A lot of tripods have this hook on the bottom and it's not for clothing. The idea is you can hang something from the bottom of it. I actually went to REI and got a collapsible canvas bucket and um, I carry it in my bag with me and I put irons in there, cookbooks, rocks, water, anything that's available to me to add mass to the tripod and then I don't have to carry this big heavy tripod around. I just put all the books back in the shelf or put the iron away. But the idea is to find something that's going to be heavy in there and add some mass and some weight to the bottom. It's really important that you think about how you're going to stabilize it. The last thing I want to say about, sorry Austin, the last thing I want to say about shooting is that you don't want to hold your camera out like this. It tends to wave and wobble and do all of those sorts of things. It's like any sort of physical or athletic sort of endeavor. You want to stand with your feet shoulder width apart. I tuck my elbows in and I hold the camera with both hands. If I can lean against something like a wall or a door jam, a parking meter, a telephone pole, I'm going to be able to actually create an even even better shot. I may put my hands on the table in front of me to hold the camera. Anything I can do to create a more stable platform is, is going to significantly increase the engagement of your audience online, actually, of, of audience no matter where they watch it. So, lighting. We've, we've talked about composition, we've talked about stabilizing the camera, now you want to make certain people can see your content. Lighting is a little bit of alchemy. When we light professionally, we tend to leverage something called three-point lighting. Usually the camera, if it's an interview, is slightly off axis. If it's somebody who's an expert, we tend to shoot directly into the camera. And then we use three lights. The main light is called the key light, and that accounts for the majority of the light on the front of their face, but that light creates shadows. So then we use something called a fill light. It's usually not as bright, and that fills in the eye sockets and the shadow under the nose and the chin and those sorts of things. And then we use a light in the back. It has a lot of different names, a rim light, a hair light, a back light, it kind of all kind of the same thing. And the idea is to put some light on the back of somebody so that they're not melting into the wall, to give them some definition, some depth to your image. 
My guess is most people in this community are not necessarily going to be dragging professional lights around. Uh, I think that's really unrealistic. But using that basic idea of having three lights, a principal light, a light to kind of fill in the shadows, and maybe a light to kind of give them some definition, you can use available resources that are in the environment. Um, the thing that creates the biggest problem for you most often is the window. People tend to go, oh, I know, I'll shoot, and they'll stand against the window, we'll have this great view behind them. The problem is that the camera can't handle how bright it is outside and that it's not very bright inside. Uh, that is a problem. So typically, I'll use the window in some way, but I won't have it in my shot. I'll use it as a key light or I'll use it as a hair light. In this case, we've used it as a rim light, and then I use desk lights all the time. Articulated desk lamps are great. You can move them up and down. You can move them around. They'll have to be fairly close because they're not as bright. And then because they're sometimes harsh, one of my favorite things in my bag is parchment paper for baking. We, we use parchment paper for baking because you can put it in the oven and it doesn't catch fire. Well, if I put a piece of parchment paper, really cost effective, in front of that light, it's what we call diffusion, and it softens the light. And I'll often use wooden clothespins. The technical name for those are C47s. Um, I'll use, I'll use clothespins on it to help um, hold it in place, and then I get a light that's uh, far more flattering. And then I'll look around and find something, anything that I can use to fill. It might be a desk lamp, another table lamp, uh, uh, something that's on the floor. I'm going to look for a, y to, a way to kind of approximate that sort of found um, resources. So every time you walk into the room, you need to look. What do I have available? The one thing I will say is that overhead lighting will almost always create the most hideous video possible. Overhead lighting is designed so you can see a paper when you write on it. So what it does, it creates these horrible shadows in the eye, under the nose, the chin. Um, it, it, people look like they're in an interrogation. It's not very flattering. And so if you can, turn off the overhead lights. Fixture I use most often, either as a key light or as a fill, is the trusty articulated desk lamp. You can adjust the brightness by adjusting the distance to your subject. If the shadows look too harsh, you can bounce the light off the wall to soften the effect. Often you'll need more than one, so don't be shy. Wander the hall to see what you can borrow. For lighting, I've used work lights from my garage, table lamps, and fluorescent lights, whatever's available. I have a few $10 lamps from uh, um, you know, the, the silver reflector lamps from the hardware store and LED lights. They don't get hot, they are daylight. And uh, uh, so in my bag, I have a couple of lights there. When I get stuck, if I need something, I can just pull out this light with an LED and I can solve a multitude of problems. But as I said, you really need to be careful of the window. You need to be careful of, of how it creates a silhouette. The most available light asset is also the biggest liability, the window. Most cameras will automatically adjust the exposure for the brightest thing in the frame. Shooting an interview against the window can result in a silhouette. Sunlight from a window can be used if you are careful. The light can be very harsh, so if there are blinds, adjust them to balance the sunlight with the other lights in the room. And that's just a Luxo lamp in front of him. Uh, lighting in, and by reducing the light coming in from the window behind them, the camera automatically adjusts to make his face the brightest thing. Uh, it, it is um, just kind of understanding how your camera is going to treat light can really do tremendous things to help you uh, through that process. If I need a window, I, if I have a window available often, and, and I have no other lights, often rather than shooting with the person facing uh, with their back to the window, I instead use the window as my key light. That's not direct sunlight. Direct sunlight is really harsh, but that's the ambient light coming in from a window, and that can help immensely to create lighting that is far more interesting and something that you can work with in that environment. Okay. This is an example of how not to do things. What we're doing right now. This is somebody talking about a product, but the camera has adjusted for the brightest thing in the background. It's handheld. You can't see him. You can't hear him. You have no idea what he's talking about. And that's really common with the content that I see. And the viewfinders in many of these cameras, 
make the image look a little better in the viewfinder than it is in reality. And so you need to work with the camera enough to know if it's giving you a false positive. Two last things here real quick. One is audio. There are a lot of different types of microphones. It's really confusing. Um, you're really likely only to use one of two types of microphones. Either an omnidirectional microphone, that's on what's most, most cameras, or a directional microphone, a shotgun, that's the kind of microphone that we're using here today. Come on, are you gonna play? Are you gonna play? Nope, you're not gonna play. Rats. Um, sorry. If you're shooting your video with something small, like a pocket camera, or even your mobile phone, and you want to capture audio that your audience can hear and understand, but all you have is the microphone that's on the device, then you need to be close to the sound source. Really close. Okay, this is probably too close. If I need to rely on this microphone or the one that's in my camera, there are two things I always try to bear in mind. One, I try not to be in too noisy of an environment. Two, I try not to shoot further than arm's length away from the person I'm interviewing. That way the camera's microphone will do a good job of picking up the sound. Nothing gets in the way of your video like bad audio. If your audience has to work to hear what's being said, they're going to leave. So if you're shooting a story where audio is critical to understanding your story, you might want to think about using an external microphone. What should you look for? Well, first, make certain your camera has an external audio input. For example, this one does, this one doesn't. For interviews and presentations, choose a lavalier. A lavalier microphone is a small microphone that clips onto clothing. Because it's a better quality mic and close to the sound source, your audio is going to sound better. They range in price from $20 to $200, and even a cheap one is going to sound better than the microphone that's on your camera. So, you're, there are a lot of options out there in terms of improving your audio, but your, the abandonment rates for videos with bad audio is unbelievable. Um, 10 seconds is absolutely right, but you have 0.4 seconds when they're going to decide whether they're going to watch it or not. And if they have to work to hear the audio, it's like, I'm going to go find something else. There's so many options, there's so much content up there. Currently on YouTube, we're, uh, they're posting 144,000 hours of content every day. So there's likely something that touches on your topic that has good audio. So they're not going to stay if, if, if your audio is bad. There we go. And you have to listen to the audio. Headphones are better, over-the-ear headphones. If you have earbuds, um, there we go. If you have earbuds, uh, it's okay, but they're designed to have sound link in so you don't get hit by a bus. That's why over-the-ear headphones are much better, but you really need to, uh, re really need to uh, listen. And the last thing I want to talk about here real quick is framing your shot for your interview. Kind of setting up with Hanson. There's a psychology to how someone is seen in the frame. We tend to use extreme wide shots as a way to establish a venue rather than someone else. If you have an interview with someone this far away, they're paying attention to the environment rather than the wide shot. Even a somewhat of a wide shot, what we're changing here is what the audience is paying attention to. The closer we get to the subject, the more we're emphasizing the person rather than the environment they're in. Medium wide shot, this is sometimes called a cowboy because you can see them draw their guns in the old westerns. We're still seeing the environment, but more and more we're paying attention to the subject in her environment. Most interviews are shot with a medium shot, a head and shoulder shot. This is neutral, this is where people are giving information. This is, this is something where you still see where they are, but you're really kind of getting a sense of who they are. The medium close-up, this is where someone is really giving you the grist of what they have to say. It's the main reason why you do the interview. You really are paying attention to who they are and what they talk about. If you go closer than the medium close-up, if you go into, I know it's going to play, it's having problems. Well, if you go to an extreme close-up, basically folks need to be crying. They need to be really emotional. That's when, like documentaries, they zoom in and they go in really tight. There's also a psychology to camera angle. When you look up at someone, 
it makes them larger than life. It's like a judge or a statue or something that is, that is, that is really big. When we shoot even slightly below their eye line, we often see them as being more credible or someone to pay attention to, someone you want, you want to uh, um, uh, uh, pay attention to. Slightly above eye line, 60 Minutes does this all the time to the people you don't trust. You're looking down on them. It's not somebody who, who you have a lot of credibility. And this angle is the angle our parents shot all of our photos as kids, which is why they tend to be so diminished. Um, there's a real psychology to how we judge someone standing in the world based upon the, the elevation of the camera. 95% of the stuff you shoot is going to be neutral. It's going to be even with their eyes. As I said, there are no rules. I actually like the slightly above angle because it's often more flattering. It gets rid of chins and bags under the eyes. So there are times when I'll, I'll move up slightly just because they look better. And, and, and that's totally fine. You need to make certain that your, the environment, the background you've chosen in your environment advances your narrative. Um, this is really problematic. First of all, we've got part of a word for launch. If you're going to use a whiteboard, either erase it or don't. A uh, partially erased whiteboard is really a problem. I have no idea. In the corner, there's a totem pole, a duck, and a viking. And frankly, this big phallus in the background is really distracting. I didn't see that until you mentioned it. That's a rocket ship, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but it, it is. It's not helpful to this woman who agreed to do the interview. She's on this white wall. They're using available lighting and you've got this really distracting background. It may make sense to you and it may have a lot of inside jokes, but to your audience, they're trying to figure out what you mean and they're not listening to what's going on. So choose your background really carefully. Location where videos go to die. Any guesses? The conference room. They are soulless places which suck the life out of your video. We often schedule them because you can get in there. They do not advance the narrative. Do everything you can to shoot in some place that tells your story. If you're working with a research scientist, shoot in the lab. If you're working with, with a, a, a professor, shoot in their office. If you're working with a team, shoot in their work environment. Give me a sense of who they are and what they're doing. Conference rooms do not tell us anything other than the lowest bidder of the paint supplier. So you also need to avoid shooting on white backgrounds. They do not look like an Apple ad. They're extremely hard to light. People tend to be too close. You just keep waiting for them to hold up the newspaper like a hostage. Do not shoot against a white environment it, unless you're in a studio with limbo. Try to find something that advances the narrative. It is just not an appealing or flattering place to shoot. Framing your shot is not difficult. Think of this rectangle as your canvas. And just like an artist, you want to be thoughtful about how you use every square inch of that canvas. You're going to use this frame differently depending upon your intended message. For example, if you're trying to teach someone something or you want to talk directly to them, that means you'll be centered up in the frame looking right at the camera. For example, a web camera. Well, I guess a video blog is about me. <laughs> or podcast. Well, and welcome to episode 13 of the HD podcast. Watch the HD version because not only is the picture better, and the content on the internet is the prize. <laughs> or do it yourself show. We're going to go ahead and pick off our spaghetti. We're going to pull in and back out. Your tree will be healthy and strong. But if you're interviewing someone, you're going to use the camera a little bit differently. The camera is now an observer. Think third person. And you're going to give the subject of your interview a little bit more room, something called look room. That means we're going to give more space in the front of their face and less room in the back of their head. And because the camera is an observer, you're going to shoot the interview at a slight angle. It, it feels a little more natural as an observer. The area up here, well, this is called headroom, and you don't want too much of it. Finally, you want to make certain that you fill the entire frame of the interview. But you don't want to be too close because it can be a little scary. And if you're too far away, your viewers won't know where to look. <laughs> so frame your shot with a nice head and shoulders. And remember, fill the frame. If you're doing an interview, give yourself a little bit of look room. If you think of your frame as a canvas, you'll do great.
last bit because we're seeing more and more stuff acquired in mobile. What's wrong with this shot? Don't say it's a string band. Pardon what? No. Vertical video. We're having more and more content that's coming in leveraging vertical phone based video. Oddly enough, when we try to leverage it, this is what it looks like. We have nothing to do with it. The only choice we have is to either tell everybody to tip their monitor sideways or to do vignetting or pillar boxing. You need to turn the camera the same aspect ratio as the screens that we view. You've got to stop vertical video. So with that, let me jump over to Hanson. Oh, thanks. Did you, Did you want to say something? Yeah. So, Drew, <laughs> we always ask our, our panelists to give us uh, two or three great tips. Drew always comes up with about 19. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but really great stuff. So thank you very much for that. So now we're kind of taking a look at the technical aspects of creating a better interview. Where we turn now is to Hanson Hossein and thinking about planning for interviewing that subject and getting the most out of them. And and we we are really lucky today to have one of the best. Has Hanson has interviewed some of the the the, the region's biggest newsmakers, idea generators. Uh, entrepreneurs and um, we're really lucky to have him here sharing some of his tips and tricks for getting the most out of that interview. So go. And I, I imagine in the context of what you'll be doing, you're probably going to be interviewing professors or experts, scholars, researchers in the context of, of um, the departments wherever else you're working. And so although this is professionally produced because I have the benefit of working with UWTV crews, um, I think uh, there's some basics you can extract from the three clips I'm going to show you. There'll be three clips. I want to tell you three stories about each of those interviews. Um, and they relate to three lessons. One's about preparation. The other one's about drawing emotion from your interview subject. And the third one is about trying to find ways to personalize it. <clears throat> so typically speaking, when I'm interviewing, when I'm getting ready to interview somebody, I actually put a lot of work in, in, in advance into the research. Because what I want by the time I arrive in front of those cameras to talk to somebody <clears throat> is that they don't, that the actual preparation is totally transparent. They don't see it. I can always tell when uh, a television station has sent an intern to, to interview me because they usually have a list of questions in front of them and they're reading each question as they go and they're not actually listening to me and having a conversation. And so to me that's foremost what you want to do to make somebody feel comfortable and draw the most out of them is to prepare to have that conversation uh, by listening to them first. So uh, the first clip I'm going to show you is of Howard Schultz, who's the CEO of Starbucks, who's being interviewed a ton load of times. So what I did for preparation for him was to read his most recent book, read every article that talks about his entrepreneurial vision, plus what has happened most recently to Starbucks, so I had the most recent statistics, and, um, and watch him in some of those interviews ahead of time so I knew how he would behave on camera. So by the time that he would come to the studio, I was prepared for somebody who was really media savvy and I could deal with him. The challenge was that he arrived 45 minutes late to the 45 minutes early to the studio and I was still in makeup. And none of this stuff you don't have to worry about, but the thank goodness I had done preparation in advance because he kind of put us off balance, both from a production point of view and from an editorial point of view. Um, luckily we were able to we were able to actually sort of kick in really quickly, but we had to get the higher ground again in terms of being able to get what we needed out of him. So I'll just show you the clip and I'll give you a bit more background on it. Ashley Rose, who's my uh, colleague and uh, producing, is here as well. Did you want to say anything else in terms of remembering that time when Howard Schultz came into the studio and we were oh, scrambling? Well, we just, uh, we're lucky to have a crew that was on the spot and ready to go because I ran into the studio and said, well, he's here 45 minutes early and he has to leave an hour earlier than we thought he had to leave. So he was giving us very condensed time, and my crew said, give us 10 minutes and we can be ready to roll. So that was a perfect amount of time to get him from makeup into the studio. And had they not been nimble like that, we would have lost uh, the interview with him because he had to go at a certain time and we needed a full hour with him. And so what I usually, uh, in this situation, I, I usually I don't necessarily have a list of questions. I actually have a narrative that I want to follow. So based on all the research, okay, this is what I want to get out of him, and here's the narrative arc of that conversation. And I usually have the kickoff question in my head. Uh, and in this situation, we wanted to play it a little bit because I knew he's really serious and straight-laced. So you wanted to find a way 
to, to connect to him. So we've actually found out from a few of my students who work at Starbucks what his favorite coffee was. And we went to the Starbucks store at, at the headquarters and bought the coffee that he liked and we actually prepared for him. So I'll just, I hope I got this right in terms of how it's gonna work. Here's Howard Schultz. Should I just hit it again? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Howard Schultz, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, you've actually mentioned that there's an emotion, the emotional connection is your true value proposition at Starbucks. So I, I brought some Starbucks coffee that we bought at your support center. Thank you. And I hope we got it right, because I know you take this very seriously. So I'm going to pour you some Wonderful. coffee. I understand you take it black. That's great. Thanks. OK. Wonderful. Um, now, this is your indivisible cup, which is a collector's item, I understand. <laughs> Why? I mean, we think of Starbucks as this incredibly profitable company, but you talk about that emotional connection first and foremost. Why is that so important? Well, it's not only an emotional connection. I, I think it goes beyond that. I, I think when we uh, began building the company, we created uh, a different uh, business proposition. Uh, not better than anyone else, but it really was different. And that was from the very beginning, recognizing that success would be best if it was shared. And in a sense, building a company that would try and achieve the fragile balance between profitability and a social conscience. So the emotional connection that you're asking about uh, speaks to the relationship that we wanted to have with our people first. We recognized early on that they were going to be the, the brand and the promise was going to come from them. And as managers and leaders, if, if we were going to try and exceed the expectations of our customers, then emotionally and through a large reservoir of trust, we had to exceed the expectations as managers and leaders of our people first. And I think that began to create uh, the unique relationship we have with our people and the relationship they have with the customers. So, uh, a couple of things about that interview, uh, that, that particular clip. First of all, um, be, given that we were off kilter because of the, the timing, it was really important to have that first question in my head. And th that was really crucial in terms of how we would set the, the tone and the atmosphere and kicking off editorially where we were going to go with this. And I knew that the bottom line to Howard Schultz, and I think that he would probably enjoy most talking about, was that although Starbucks is an enormously successful business that makes a ton load of money, um, that it, it, Starbucks means a lot more to him than just profit. And so that was going to be the overall narrative to the show, and I wanted to set that up immediately, that we were going to get into this, the company's social consciousness and how it treats its employees and how it set the tone for this around the world, and that this is actually a un uniquely Pacific Northwest thing. So that was going to be the show, and that first question really did set the tone. The second thing is, um, one of the hardest things to do when you're first beginning to do interviews like this is knowing when to ask the next question, when to interject, what to say, and when to shut up. And in this situation, you got Howard Schultz, who's one of the most successful businessmen in the world. You let these guys speak until you kind of find a natural place to insert yourself, or you actually think, you know, that's a pretty good idea. Let's go deeper into this and ask him a follow-up question, even if you're going to interrupt him. Another sign of an amateur is somebody who says, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and nods their head the entire time while you're listening to that interview subject, because you hear the mm-hmm, which is not cool, and it just, it just, it actually looks really automatic. It doesn't actually look like you're really focused. So what I tend to do when I'm sitting with somebody like that is I, I, I really focus in on their eyes, and I'm intent, and I'm only, I'm really listening to them. There's no distractions whatsoever, which is why it's so important not to write down your questions, because the last thing you want to do is break that eye contact to look down and see what that next question is. You've got to be thinking about the next two questions in your head, even as you're listening to him, and then figure out when it's the most appropriate time to break in. So that's on the art of sort of preparation. The second is on emotion. Um, interviews are kind of boring, uh, especially when you're talking to something, somebody about technical things. And, and what you really want to drive at, especially with the kind of people you speak at the university, if you can't get them to cry, which is not going to happen, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is to tap into their passion. Um, and these experts are passionate. They, they, they've devoted their entire lives to it. This interview that I'm going to show you is with Lee Rhodes, and she is the CEO and founder of Glassy Baby, which is a Seattle company. You may have seen these wonderful photos that they make. And she's a three-time cancer survivor. And she got the idea that, uh, that this light is something that you can bring into somebody's life no matter how hard it is. And so I also knew that Lee was a bit nervous on camera, despite the fact that she's gotten a lot of media attention. So I thought the best way to handle this was to, at some point, um, 
and let her know that I'd made the connection myself to her product. So before, in preparation for that interview, I actually took my daughter, who was, who was five, to Glassy Baby at the U Village, and I, we chose a Glassy Baby that we would bring on set. But I wanted my daughter to experience that as well. And so I was able to tell that story to Lee during the interview and then get her to open up about why emotion is so important to the product that she puts out there. Uh, and so that actually made a huge difference. I think it put her at ease. Uh, it, it showed her that I was actually not just Sometimes an interview is like exploitation or mining. You're trying to mining information. And this, I was trying to establish that you know, what she had done meant something to me as well, and that there was a, a level of reciprocity. And that actually goes a long way in terms of putting somebody at ease. So here's Lee Rhodes, who created Glassy Baby. How do they perceive that purchase, you think? I do. I think that, they're, I think that people are beginning to write stories with Glassy Baby, and we, we do it through our community. So people bring, in order to really appreciate a Glassy Baby, you know, you did it for your daughter. Your daughter came. She had an idea of her favorite color. She will always remember that this is her glassy baby. And there are very few things in life you can say that about. You know, you get, when, you get, when you have three children, you get three different Pat the Bunny books. And they're all important because they mean something then. But as time goes on, you can't remember, like, who's Pat the Bunny. But frankly, I can't even tell my three kids apart and their children about me photos. You know what I mean? So there are very few things in life that can really note and um, encourage just remembering things that are important in community. I know she's told the story of, of the origins of Glassy Baby m millions of times, and I wanted to make sure that she told that story in a, in a way that felt like was, she was doing it for the first time. So making that connection ahead of time, and knowing when to go to the, like the climax of the interview, the stuff that you really want, is also important. So I was not going to ask her right off the bat, you know, how did you come up with the idea for Glassy Baby, because I'd get the pedestrian answer. I wanted to build up to it and build up our rapport and our relationship before we went to that, and she gave probably the best answer I've ever heard her give on that subject. The final example is about how to really personalize an interview with somebody who's not, um, who's really guarded, who knows how to play the game uh, and doesn't give that stuff away for free. And in this situation, Jeff Bezos, who's the founder of Amazon, um, his people protect him. And we had to go through a lot of negotiations to actually get them to agree to put him on camera uh, for this interview. And so I knew that we had some real rules of engagement we had to obey and that it was going to make it feel very rigid. So I did um, two things. First of all, um, I usually interview my, my, my notepad during all my interviews as an iPad. For Jeff Bezos, I was not going to put an Apple product in front of him. <laughs> so I took a, I got a Kindle paper, I have a Kindle Paperwhite, and I actually converted my, um, my document to something that I could upload to the Kindle. And so we're sitting there waiting for him to go. The set is hot. And um, he walks right in. And they're going to take 20 seconds to put his makeup on. Then we're going to go. And the first thing he does, he comes and he sits down. And he looks at me. And he sees the paper white. And he says, nice, nice, nice device. Like, he really noticed that. And that made all the difference in the world that I was willing to play at that level with him. And so that just brought down the level of tension immediately. And we had, a, in this situation, we actually had agreed upon questions. This was not going to be a hugely spontaneous interview. But as I sort of felt him out and realized that that was more his handlers than him, I felt like I could push him a little bit more. So in the end, I started to ask him a very personal question. And he actually played along. There was no reservation. Nobody stepped in and said, you can't ask Jeff Bezos this. So here's, here's Jeff near the end of the interview. I have a few rapid fire questions for you that we're asking of all of our innovators being featured at the exhibit, so you can answer in one word or whatever. Your favorite Seattle hangout to get a clear head? My favorite Seattle hangout to get a clear head? My shower. Excellent. Why are showers so <laughs> prone to innovation? Very I get my best ideas. Relaxing. <laughs> you're alone. You have one of those rainforest shower heads? Very, you know, it's a very good place to do your best deep thinking. That was not an agreed upon and, uh, question, and I decided to push it a little further and ask that follow-up question. The follow-up questions are really important because you know, although you might have a list of things you want to ask, to actually push them a little bit further and to, f and to show that you're listening and to extract something beyond what they would normally say um, is, is pretty important. And we, we, uh, there was one point, Jeff Bezos always says the, art, the, the success, Amazon success is because of the small group meetings they have. And he always talks about this two pizza meeting. Enough people in the room to eat two pizzas. So I knew he was going to say that. And he said it. And it was exactly how he said it to Charlie Rose and everybody else over the last few years. So I said, my follow-up question was, uh, how much pizza do you eat? <laughs> and he says, sometimes I eat the whole pizza. And that was great, you know, to get something different, right, to push him a little along. 
So it takes a little bit of courage to do that, but you also have to know how much you've warmed them up and established that connection. So those are just three really sh short examples of the way I approach these interviews. It's ultimately about um, establishing that one-on-one -on -one where there, there's a give and take and people feel like they actually want to talk to you and that you're not there to abuse them or to, to, to take something you don't, that they don't want to give you. It's like they want to, they want to, you want them to make them feel comfortable and those are the ways that we've done that very successfully in doing these interviews. What is Howard Schultz's favorite coffee? Howard Schultz is a Sumatra what? Sumatra. Sumatra. So, uh, and he, so he does two coffees. He does, a, he does that in the morning. He makes his own coffee every morning with the French press, and then later on the day he goes to one of the Starbucks coffee um, stores and, and gets a cappuccino or something. Other questions for Pam? We get a lot of researchers that use six-syllable words to describe what they're trying to tell you and what they're passionate about. How do you break through that and get it to a place where people can understand? Well, that's a good question. Um, it, I, and I would actually get them to want to help you. And for this series that we did last year, we were doing it in collaboration with the Museum of History and Industry, and the primary um, audience was going to be 12 to 15 year olds who you want to be the next innovators, the next Howard Schultz's and Jeff Bezos. So we told, I said to them, I want you to speak to me as if you're actually talking to a 13 year old girl who wants to be the next you. And so if you frame it that way and they understand that that's how they should communicate, then they will do that. Now, if they think they're going to speak to their peers who are judging them in scholarly publications and stuff, they're going to stick to the jargon. Uh, and that may be appropriate, yeah. but you've got to basically frame it for them and keep hammering away at it. Other questions? I was just going to say, I think it's also important to note that Hansen never talks to the guests beforehand for longer than quick hellos. If we do any pre-interviews or anything, it's always the producer, so that what you see on camera is true, genuine conversation, because we don't want them to ever say, oh, well, when I was talking to you earlier, or mm -hmm. last time when we did this, or something. So either you, you prep the guests so that they don't say things like that, or you make sure that you are doing that work before your interviewer gets them. That's great. Good. I'm going to round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our, our guests. You guys gave some great tips and hints and I hope you all go forth and create more video. We'll do another one of these in, in uh, two months. Hope to see you back and enjoy your weekend. Thanks for coming. Uh, there's a survey at the back uh, with, uh, my, with my wonderful uh, assistant Lorna. Uh, if you fill that out there's actually a, an opportunity to, to uh, get a hundred dollars off a video project that you might do with us in the future. So. Take some time to fill it out. Tell us what you thought of today. Tell us what you'd like to hear more about in the future. And uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for coming, everybody. Ooh. And there's chocolate marshmallow things tonight. Yeah, <laughs> peeps! <laughs> I thought Drew was going to give us a